As a golden age of superheroes on television drew to a close, a new standard of realism emerged. Space and science fiction heroes grounded by their relatability depicted as flawed and complex individuals burdened with power and responsibility as opposed to just capes and clever gadgets. But this isn't Superman cashing in at the box office. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Ralph. Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the history of The Greatest American Hero. Thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. Go to CuriosityStream.com slash Galaxy Media to save 25% right now. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of nonfiction movies and shows from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. CuriosityStream has millions of subscribers and new shows every week on history, science, tech, military history, and more. It's also extremely affordable at under $20 a year. Curiosity Stream is about being curious. It's in the name, and they cover the entire spectrum of things that you might want to know more about. Check out First Man, a title that makes a bold claim on the internet. It's not about men who say first in the comments section on YouTube, but it does follow the trail of the great primates of 25 million years ago as they journey around the world developing into Homo erectus and then to Homo sapiens, eventually evolving to the point where a guy like that can exist. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms. It's the world's first streaming service addressing our lifelong quest to learn, to explore, and more importantly, to understand. Click the link below or go to curiositystream.com slash galaxy media and save 25% right now. That's only $14.99 for the whole year. Again, that's curiositystream.com slash galaxy media. And thank you again to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. The Greatest American Hero is a live-action television superhero drama slash comedy that aired 45 episodes over three seasons on the ABC network in the U.S. from 1981 to 1983. Part Green Lantern, part Welcome Back Cotter, Ralph Hinckley is your friendly neighborhood reluctant hero. Ralph Hinckley is a mild-mannered high school teacher taking on the challenge of dealing with some of the toughest, most delinquent kids the city has to offer. Abandoned by every other educator and administrator that has crossed their paths, Hinckley believes he's the one who can make a difference in their lives. Meanwhile, on the verge of divorce, fighting for custody of his son, he is thrust into a world of fantastic adventure and incredible power. One night after taking his students on a field trip into the desert, he and Bill Maxwell, the FBI agent he recently met at a diner, are confronted by actual aliens from beyond the stars. Communicating through the radio in Bill's car, the aliens tell Ralph and Bill that they have been chosen to be protectors of the planet Earth. The aliens present them with a suit of extraordinary power, the instructions to operate it, and the organizational structure to carry out the mission. Ralph will be the one wearing the suit. Bill will provide information and intelligence assessment, helping guide Ralph as to where and when to use the suit's powers for the benefit of every living creature on Earth. Ralph and Bill aren't the best of partners. Bill is a federal agent dedicated to doing things by the book. Ralph literally lost the instruction booklet given to him by the aliens to operate the suit. It is their opposite nature that makes them perfect partners as they learn by doing. The duo is made a trio by the inclusion of Pam Davidson, Ralph's divorce attorney turned girlfriend, who is the only other person who knows Ralph's superheroic secret and the secret alien origin of the supersuit itself, providing a third objective voice in the use of the incredible powers of the suit. Flight, super strength, invisibility, x-ray vision, speed, and a whole lot more that Ralph will have to figure out along the way. His hero's journey is going to be riddled with mistakes, failures, and experimentation, just trying to be a better hero, if not the greatest. The Greatest American Hero was created and produced by Stephen J. Cannell, fresh off a run of television production for Universal that included shows like The Rockford Files and Beretta, success that allowed him to establish his own company in 1979 called Stephen J. Cannell Productions. The first series from Cannell Productions was Ten Speed and Brown Shoe, a detective-slash-comedy series for ABC that inherited writers who had worked on Cannell's Emmy-winning, recently canceled NBC series, The Rockford Files. After just one season of 14 episodes, ABC went back to Cannell looking for a more family-friendly series. ABC wanted a show with superheroes, with powers. CBS still had the Hulk and previous success with Wonder Woman. Superman had just been in theaters for a second time, and a new era of science fiction was booming after the success of movies like Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and television shows like Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers. ABC wanted a show that would air at 8 o'clock, which meant that it had to be suitable for a younger audience than Cannell's shows normally appealed to. Cannell said the only way he would do a superhero show is if he could have some fun with it. Perhaps he could do with superheroes what he had done with detectives in The Rockford Files. Take all of the cliches of the genre and step all over them. 
The Greatest American Hero was a different kind of superhero show. Unlike the Hulk or Wonder Woman or Superman, the powers came from the suit. Crafted by aliens, only wearable by Ralph Hinckley, those powers were non-transferable, so they were still bound to that individual. The character's character is what truly made him special. Cannell wanted to pursue stories motivated by the people, by the core characters of Ralph Hinckley, his girlfriend slash attorney Pam Davidson, and FBI agent Bill Maxwell. He wanted to introduce superpowers into normal people's lives and see how that affected them, their relationships, their hopes and dreams, and what kind of people they could be. That's also what drove the humor, Ralph's inability to control the suit because he lost the instructions. He's not Batman, he's not Captain America, he doesn't have mastery of all these abilities. He's usually just discovering them in the moment, under duress, and reacting the way a normal person might. Hilarity ensues. William Cat plays Ralph Hinckley, a character name that went through phases during the run of the series. Initially Hinckley, then changed to Hanley to avoid any association with the real-life John Hinckley Jr. after he tried to kill President Ronald Reagan. Again. The name was changed back to Hinkley after things cooled down a bit. Cat wasn't initially excited about playing a superhero, he was concerned about being typecast. Cannell met with him personally and convinced him to take the role, but he couldn't convince him to like the suit. According to Cat, he felt hideous. Which works for the performance because Ralph hates it too. That suit, like the character, is an original design for the series, complete with a chest emblem that stands for Something. According to Cannell, it was created in a moment of mundane inspiration. When the costume designer asked him what the chest emblem was going to look like, Cannell confessed that he hadn't thought about it. The designer looked around the room, saw a pair of scissors sitting on the desk, held them upside down, and said, there you go. Its visual resemblance to the Chinese kanji character Center resulted in the show being translated for Hong Kong as Flying Red Center Hero. If anything, that symbol helped the production recycle flying footage of Ralph given its symmetrical design, a problem that has plagued Superman film productions for decades. Comparisons to Superman couldn't be avoided. Some casual, like having a cape and being a superhero. Some were more specific, and that concerned Superman's parent company, Warner Brothers. Ralph's ability to fly, his speed, and the similarities of the costume were enough for them to take ABC to court in a lawsuit that was ultimately dismissed. Pam Davidson was played by Connie Selica. Bill Maxwell was played by veteran actor Robert Culp. Early on-screen tension between Ralph Hinckley and FBI agent Bill Maxwell was real. Initially, Culp and Cat weren't that fond of each other, and the production used it to their advantage. I don't know how it happened or why I was chosen, but every time I put on this suit, something happened. And nobody understands. Not my friends. Good God, Ralph. Superpowers. Not my son. Dad, what is that? Not even this crazy FBI agent that I know. Kid, you really are hopeless. But when they're in trouble, who do they call? The greatest, the greatest American, American hero. hero. That's right. The greatest legacy of The Greatest American Hero is the theme song titled Theme from The Greatest American Hero, Believe It or Not. Written by Mike Post and Stephen Geyer, performed by Joey Scarberry, the lyrics are inspired by the story of Ralph's unexpected entrance into the world of being a superhero, heavy emphasis on the reluctant part. Look at what's happened to me, I can't believe it myself. Suddenly I'm on top of the world, it should have been somebody else. Flying away on a wing in a prayer, who could it be? Believe it or not, it's just me. The song itself hit number two on the Billboard Hot 100 in August of 1981 and still gets regular radio play today. It was Scarberry's biggest hit, although he would go on to write and record other songs. He teamed up with Mike Post again in 1983 to record the theme for another Cannell production, Hard Castle and McCormick. Stephen J. Cannell's hope for The Greatest American Hero was to avoid the tropes and cliches of traditional superhero TV shows. His plan was to focus on the relationships between the characters and the world they live in, while avoiding the churn of weekly plots that centered on the next calamity to be solved using the powers of the suit. ABC initially supported Cannell's approach to the series, but things changed in 1982 when executives Marcy Carsey and Tom Werner left to form their own production company called Carsey Warner Productions. The new management at ABC pressed Cannell to shift the tone of the show for an even younger audience. Despite its positioning as a kid's show, there wasn't a lot of licensed merchandise to go along with it. No comprehensive assortment of action figures, vehicles, and playsets, and perhaps that was part of the problem for ABC. Mego was well versed in the licensing of television properties and superheroes, shows like Dukes of Hazard, Chips, and Happy Days, and since 1972 they had been producing figures for their world's greatest superheroes line. Everyone from Superman to Shazam, Spider-Man, Captain America, and the Hulk. 
As they had done with shows like Buck Rogers and Dukes of Hazard, Mego released a three and three quarter inch scale version of Pam's convertible Volkswagen Bug with Ralph in the supersuit and Bill Maxwell. It is a unique level of disrespect to produce Pam's car, but no Pam figure to go with it. While there may have been other ideas in mind for the three and three quarter inch line, nothing else was ever produced. Similarly, according to Brian Heiler of the Mego Museum, the eight inch figures were never produced for the mass market, even though samples of Ralph and Bill have surfaced in the years following. Years later in the early 2000s, Dr. Mego and the FX Toy Show produced an extremely limited run of new Ralph Hinckley figures, an entirely new sculpt that had a much better likeness of William Catt. On a blister card reminiscent of the ones that would have been released in the early 80s, complete with card art by Jack Davis. The Greatest American Hero was a mid-season replacement when it first aired, meaning that it started in March instead of November, and only had an abbreviated eight episodes. But the response was positive, and the series was picked up for a full season of 22 episodes from November of 1981 to April of 1982. Unfortunately, the changes that came with the new ABC management weren't limited to the content of the show. It also affected scheduling. Greatest American Hero was a Wednesday night show for the first two seasons, but moved to Friday night to be paired with Stephen J. Cannell's new show, The Quest. Friday night was notoriously a death slot, where shows were sent to live out their last days on their way to cancellation. The Quest itself only lasted five episodes before it was canceled. Ratings slipped and The Greatest American Hero was ushered out before airing its last four episodes. Four years later, a new Greatest American Hero pilot episode was put together that included three original core cast members, William Catt, Robert Culp, and Connie Selica. Intended to set up a new series, it tasked Ralph Hinckley with finding a replacement after his secret identity was revealed, and he became a celebrity because of it. Mary Ellen Stewart played Holly Hathaway, a teacher, environmentalist, and animal lover. Tonally, it picks up right where the original series left off, and in 1986, that didn't work for NBC, who passed on the series, choosing not to even air the pilot episode. The episode would be re-edited to a normal length episode and added to the syndication package for the series along with the four episodes of the original series that had never aired. All five episodes included in future releases on home video, a capstone to the story of Ralph Hinckley as a superhero. The Greatest American Hero would resurface in the early 2000s just as another age of superhero entertainment was beginning to set its roots. Following the success of X-Men in 2000 and Spider-Man in 2002, Disney was looking to adapt the series as a feature film. Paul Hernandez, who had already written the screenplay for Disney's upcoming 2005 release, Sky High, was going to write it after convincing Stephen J. Cannell himself that it was the right time to do it. Hernandez was able to track down the original costume from the original costume designer to show Cannell how serious he was. That said, nothing ever became of the effort. In 2008, William Catt himself got in on the action with his own attempt to revive the franchise. His publishing company, Catastrophic Comics and Arcana Studios, published a three-issue limited series that Catt himself wrote, re-establishing the origin and mythology of Ralph Hinckley in the alien suit with the events occurring in modern day as opposed to the early 80s. In 2009, another reboot was in the early stages of development. Eric Christian Olsen revealed that he had already been cast in a Greatest American Hero film that was supposed to be directed by Stephen Herrick. The project couldn't secure financing and was dead before it even had a chance to lose the instructions. Five years later in 2014, Fox ordered a pilot for a reboot. This time it was going to be produced by Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, the dynamic duo who had already produced a film adaptation of another Cannell TV series with 21 Jump Street and its sequel, 22 Jump Street. In 2018, ABC got back into the greatest American hero business with another attempted reboot, this time starring Hannah Simone. This pilot would have seen Simone as a 30-year-old tequila and karaoke enthusiast who has fruitlessly spent her life searching to find meaning, something that does not please her traditional Indian-American family. But everything changes when she is given a super suit to be used to protect the planet. Nanachka Khan was attached as executive producer with Rachna Fruchtbaum writing, both of whom had worked on ABC's hit sitcom, Fresh Off the Boat. Unfortunately, this pilot went the way of previous attempts as rumors suggested that Disney felt it was too off-brand for them. I must be out before I pick up the phone. Where could I be? <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm not home. Perhaps this world of ours isn't ready for a superhero like Ralph Hinckley or derivations thereof. Perhaps this world oversaturated by superheroes hasn't quite reached the point where it can appreciate a concept that subverts all the cliches of the genre the way the greatest American hero did. Perhaps the series and the characters said everything they had to say about superheroes and the genre the first time around, and there isn't anything more that need be said. For all the heroic adventures that Ralph, Bill, and Pam experienced together, it is the words of Joey Scarberry that have persisted over the years, that speak to us today through our radios and streaming music services. Just like the light of a new day, it hit me from out of the blue, breaking me out of the spell I was in, making all of my wishes come true. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air, I never thought I could feel so free, flying away on a wing and a prayer. Who could it be? 
Believe it or not, it's just Ralph Hinckley. I faked that one. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Check us out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy if you're in the, excuse me, sir, if you're in the position to help channel, the channel grow. If you'd like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below if you're more of a Ralph Hinckley or if you're more of a Bill Maxwell. I think, and I'm going to need secondary confirmation here from Greg, <laughs> I think I'm the Ralph Hinckley and he's the Bill Maxwell. The main difference between us and the TV show characters is that Greg would never work for the government and I would not hesitate to throw on a superhero costume, <laughs> even one without powers. <laughs> <laughs> <Cut>. <laughs>